Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. First, a question. So the blackboard is very long. Everybody can read from one side to the other, or is better that I keep just in the central part of the blackboard? Yeah, the, the last two is uh, okay, but from here to there is okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so I want to start with the first part of the series of talks. So I want to introduce hats. So what is a height? So in geometry, uh, we have the degree and the degree in some sense measures how complicated uh, an object is from the geometric point of view. For instance, in a polynomial, the degree of the polynomial tells you how many parameters do you need to describe the, the polynomial. So it tells you how much information do you need to, to single the polynomial. Or if you are looking at curves, the degree will tell you how winded or how complicated you can make a curve. So if the curve has genus, has a degree one, it has to be aligned. If it has a degree two, it's also very simple. And as the degree goes up, it starts to be more and more complicated. Then in arithmetic, the height should be something analog. So it should be something that tells you how arithmetically complicated is an object, or you want how much information do you need to uh, describe this object. Okay, so this is a very vague idea, but is the idea behind the definition of heights. And let's try to construct heights for more and more complicated objects. So let's start with the heights of rational numbers. So one, one, rational numbers. So I have my rational number Q, and let's say that this is a non-zero rational number. And then I will be able to write it as A over B, where A and B are integers and co-prime. And then if my height should tell me something about how much information do I need to describe this point? For instance, how much computer memory do I need to, to describe this point? So a natural candidate will be to define the height of Q just like the logarithm of the absolute, for instance, of the maximum of the absolute value of A and the absolute value of B. You see that the logarithm is because to uh, store a number in a computer, what you need, the space you need, is the number of, of digits, which is more or less proportional to the logarithm. And then now you get put something that is more or less proportional to the size. So this is one example, but there are many variants. For instance, you can say, okay, this maybe is not the right one. We can write the log of the absolute value of A plus the absolute value of B. So this will be closer to the real space you need, or you can write instead of the natural logarithm, you can put the logarithm in base two, or you can put the logarithm of A squared plus B squared and the square root. So some kind of Euclidean height. So all of these will be examples of heights. But let's start with this one that will be the canonical height for a starting point. And keep in mind that in some sense, this height is a little bit uh, fluffy that we need different notions of heights for different purposes. Okay, but then for algebra, rational numbers, that's okay. Let's go now to uh, algebraic integers or algebraic numbers. Now I have Q, again, this is from zero, but this time it belongs to Q bar. And I want to define a height of this number. Now, I already have an invariant that describes how complicated is Q, which is the degree, what is the, the degree of the minimal field of containing Q. So the height should be something that complements the degree. So it's not something that has to contain the information of the degree, but it's something that with the degree will in some sense tell me how much information do I need to determine Q. Now, on the other hand, if I take an algebraic number and I look at all the conjugates, from the point of view of the algebra, there is no way to distinguish them. I mean, all the conjugates are, I take all the possible embeddings of a field that contains a number, and I look at the different images of this point in the complex numbers, this will be the conjugates, 
And from an algebraic point of view, they have exactly the same property. So the height of a number and the height of the conjugate should be the same, which means that in order to describe the height, possibly it's enough to consider the minimal polynomial of the point of the number and then try to work with this minimal polynomial. So let's PQ be the minimal polynomial of Q. What does it mean? This means that P of Q will be a polynomial in set of P with integral coefficients. So P of Q will be written as AD times T to the D plus plus A zero. And then I will also ask that AD is positive, that all the integers AD A zero, so that the polynomial is primitive. So the <coughs> ideal generated by all these coefficients is one. And then I will ask to have minimal degree with respect to all the polynomials that satisfies this condition. So this is the minimal polynomial of the, of the number Q and is unique once we have fixed Q. And then I will write alpha one up to alpha D will be the root complex roots of this polynomial P of Q. These are exactly the conjugates of my algebraic number. M? Oh, yes. <laughs> the uh, important condition. Exactly. If not, there is no. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Okay. So then all the different roots, all the complex roots will be uh, just the conjugates. Of you. And then I define the height of the point Q will be equal to one over D, then the logarithm of the term, uh, the maximum term that I am assuming that it is positive. So I don't need to put the absolute value. And then plus the sum from J equals to one up to D of the maximum between zero and the logarithm of the absolute value of a j. In some sense, I am taking all conjugates. I am looking at the big conjugates, so the conjugates that have absolute value bigger than one, and then I consider the size. If the conjugate has a small, uh, has a small uh, size, then I just put zero. And then I add all of them and I take the, the average. This is a definition of the height. This quantity, the maximum between zero and log of a number, this will be just written as log plus of the absolute value of alpha. Okay. And <clears throat> this can be written also as the Mahler measure of the polynomial. So the Jensen formula tells me that this can be written as. one over D and then one over two pi, the integral between zero and two pi of this polynomial PQ evaluated at the point E I theta, absolute value and D. So this can be just recovered by the values of the polynomial at the roots of one. So this is a very, in some sense, elementary definition of height, but already in the realm of algebraic numbers with this definition, there are uh, still many uh, unknown uh, <coughs> conjectures. For instance, the famous Lemmer conjecture about the Mahler measure that tells me if the quantity D times height of alpha uh, has a gap around zero. So 
Which one? Yes, exactly. So let's see that if, uh, if uh, Q is rational, I get the same height. So let's assume that Q belongs to the rational numbers. Q is equal to AB. Now, what is the minimal polynomial? The minimal polynomial is B times T minus A. This is the minimal polynomial. And now what are the roots? The only root is just Q. So now I use this formula. The height of Q will be just one over one. Now the log of the this term, so the log of the absolute value of B plus the maximum between the uh, log, yeah. Plus maximum between uh, zero and the log of the absolute value of Q of A divided by B. Exactly, and now uh, we can put this as a constant, so I can put this inside the maximum, and then you can see that this is just the maximum between the log of absolute value of B and the log of absolute value of A. So this definition extends the definition for the rational numbers. Okay, well, <clears throat> as I was saying, for instance, uh, one can see that there are numbers whose height is zero, for instance, one has height zero, but then the question is, if this quantity, the degree multiplied by the height, when it is non-zero, whether there is a lower bound. So this is the Lemmer problem and is not solved yet. Yes, so what I'm saying is that the, there, is num there are numbers whose uh, degree times height is zero, okay? And there are numbers that have a height very close to zero. But if I multiply by the degree, there is a number that is a minimal one that has been achieved up to the date. And then there is a conjecture that tells that this number is, is the minimal that can be achieved, but it's not known. Exactly, that does not accumulate to zero. So that there are many numbers with zero here, and then there is an essential minimum here that is far from zero. And this is, for instance, this is not known for this quantity, for the degree times the height. Okay, but let's see now a toy example of why this quantity can be used. So let's write down two theorems. The first theorem is the Northcott theorem. Is the following, if I look at the set of all A's inside Q bar minus zero, such that the degree of A is bigger to some quantity D, and the height of A is bigger or equal to some quantity k, for instance, bigger or equal, then the number of rational numbers satisfying this quantity is finite. Okay, so this is in the base of many finiteness results. So if I can bound the height and I can bound the, the degree, then I get automatically a finite number. Let's see the proof of this. Okay. So now uh, you see that in order to prove that the set of numbers whose degree is bounded by D is finite, I can just look D by D. So I can just look at numbers so I can prove that the number of A's says that the degree of A is equal to D and the height of A is smaller or equal than K is finite. So I can repeat for different Ds. I can just do this case. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the definition of height. So it's given by this quantity. If the height of Q is smaller equal than K, then you see in this definition, the A of D is a positive integer. So this logarithm is positive. Here I am taking the maximum between zero and something. So all of these terms are positive. So automatically you get that A of D has to be smaller or equal than a exponential of the K. 
And also, every alpha j has to be smaller or equal than exponential of the k. Mm -hmm. All the roots have to be smaller than this. But now, if I have a polynomial, I can always write every coefficient ai. Yeah, question? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I want to prove this. So what I'm saying is that it is enough to prove this. Yes, because if I prove this, then it's a finite union of finite things. So what I want to do is to prove this. Yes, and then. Oh, sorry. Yes, simply let us. So this is just to fix ideas and to know that the, my uh, minimal polynomial is of a fixed degree and not have to play with different degrees, okay? Sorry. Okay, but now what we know is that the <coughs> every coefficient of the minimal polynomial, since I know the roots of the minimal polynomial and the coefficients of the minimal polynomial I've written as uh, symmetric sequences or, or symmetric polynomials on the roots, I can write, let's see. Second. Let's write A D minus R can be written as A D times the sum for A one up to A R of the alpha I. Of the alpha I J from J equal to one to R, okay? So I have that uh, every coefficient can be written as a symmetric function, but now I have bounded A of D and I have bounded all these terms here. So I readily get that this coefficient has to be smaller or equal than uh, D over R, the combinatorial number D over R, and then E to R plus one times D, okay? okay? So if the height of an algebraic integer is bounded, then the coefficients of the minimal polynomial are bounded. Now, if I look at the possible polynomials of a fixed degree and bounded coefficients, I have only a finite number of polynomials. So a finite number of solutions, and that's it. So a finite number. Of E of Q's, and this gives a proof. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now that uh, we have North Code uh, result that tells me that the number of points with a uh, bounded height is finite, let's see how can I use this result to prove another theorem. This one is by Kronecker. That tells me that if I have a number alpha that belongs to QR minus zero and the height of alpha is zero, then this is equivalent to asking that alpha is a root of one. Okay. Now let's see this theorem proof. So if alpha is a root of one, then we know that alpha and all the conjugates are roots of one. Hence they have uh, absolute value one, but log of one is just zero. So, and the main coefficient is also one. So I get zero, so it's automatically h of alpha is equal to zero by just by calculation. Now, let's 
conversely, assume that the height of alpha is equal to zero. Well, and the degree of alpha, let's say, is equal to d. Now, what happens with alpha to the power d? If I look to alpha to the power or maybe alpha to the power n, well, the degree of alpha to the power n is always smaller or equal than the degree of alpha because alpha to the power n belongs to the field generated by alpha. So the degree at most uh, can remain the same. What about the height? Well, <clears throat> with respect to the height, one can prove that the height of alpha to the power n is exactly equal to n times the height of alpha. Also just by, by using the, the formula for the height, okay? But now that we have these two properties, I can look at the following set. I can start with alpha, alpha squared, alpha q, alpha to the fourth, and so on. But now these two conditions tell me that if the height of alpha is zero, then the height of alpha to the n is also zero. So it's bounded. And the degree is bounded. So I know that this is a finite set. Okay. But if this is a finite set, this implies that alpha to some power n has to be equal to alpha to some power n. There should be two elements that are the same, and then this implies that alpha is a root of u. Okay, you see how the, the finiteness, the boundedness of the height automatically tells us something in this case. Okay. And now you can see that why this is having to do something with dynamical systems, because in some sense, what I am showing is that imposing that the height is small, the height is zero, impose some conditions on the periodicity of the element with respect to some dynamical system. So this will be, in some sense, a hint of the relation between heights and dynamical systems. Questions? OK. <clears throat> now, what I have given is a global definition of height. So the height was just given by this, for instance, this formula, just a single concrete formula. But what I want to do now is to give a new formula for the height that is made out of local contributions. So what I want to, to define is the height as a sum of different local contributions. Uh, and for this, I need to recall what are the places of a field. So let me... <clears throat> Recall that if K is a field, then a place of K is an equivalence class, equivalence class of non trivial absolute values. And the equivalence is that an absolute value is equivalent to another absolute value if and only if there exists an alpha bigger than zero such that one of them to the power alpha is equal to the other. And this is equivalent to saying that alpha and alpha prime gives the same topology. Topology on K. So one can prove that these two conditions are equivalent. Okay. So a place is an equivalence class of non trivial absolute values. And then a normalized place is just a place 
plus a choice of representation. And we have Ostrovsky theorem. That tells me that if my field is Q, then the set of all places is just the usual absolute value the absolute value infinity, that is just uh, the usual one. And then for every P prime, we have the P norm of Q that is defined as follows. So if Q is equal to P to the R times A, B, A over B, and A and B are co-prime with P, then the P norm is just P to the minus R. And then Oskosi theorem tells me that these are all possible places of uh, Q. And now if I have K a field and MK a set of normalized places, then we say that uh, MK satisfies the product formula if for every element inside k minus zero, if I look at the product for all b inside mk of the absolute value of x, the Viadic absolute value, this is equal to one. Or in additive terms, that the sum for all b inside mk of the logarithm of the absolute value of xb is equal to zero. Okay, so we say that a set of places satisfies the product formula if we have this property here. Okay. In some sense, this formula is tells me that the set of places I've chosen is somewhat complete. For instance. So the basic example is Q. You see that with the definition I have given to you of the absolute values, if I take any rational number, then it's clear that the original absolute value is equal to the inverse of the products of all the periodic absolute values. Hence, the product formula is automatically satisfied. But to give a completely different example, let's say that I have C a curve over the complex numbers. And I take a MC, a M of the, uh, well, take K is equal to the function field of my curve C. And I take as M of K, just the set of points inside my curve. What? Yeah, the curve is over the complex numbers, well, but the, the function field of C. I mean, if you want, well, it's C or. I mean, the K is not because the original one was K, it's because it is the core of C. Okay, and then M of K will be just the set of points of the curve. And the absolute value of a function F at a point P will be just E to minus the valuation at the point P of the function F. Okay, so this is a, an absolute value on the field of functions over C, and it satisfies the product formula. So for every F inside uh, K, what we know is that the sum for all P inside the curve C of the valuation at the point P of F is equal to zero. So it satisfies automatically the product formula. So these are the two basic examples of fields with product formula. One's coming from the rational numbers and the finite extensions, 
as we will explain now, and the ones coming from KEPS. And in some sense, the fact that these two fields satisfy the product formula, in some sense, tells us that uh, geometric curves and number fields should be very much related and should have similar properties. Okay. Okay, now we have the notion of heights. We have the heights of Q. We have the heights of a curve. What happens if I go to an extension? <clears throat> so I have uh, F and K uh, fields. And let's say that F is a finite extension of K. Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, W is a place of F and B is a place, place of K, then we'll say that definition, we say that W divides B if and only if if I take the absolute value as a W, any representative of this guy, I restrict it to K, then I get something which is equivalent to the any absolute value of B. Okay, so we'll say that a place divides another one. When I restrict to K, I obtain this place here. Okay. Now assume that I have already chosen. So if I have already normalized. some mk, I have a set of places on mk which are normalized, and then I define as mf just the set of w's, places of f, such that w divides a b, and b belongs to m of k, okay? Uh, so it's important that when I take a set of places, in general, I do not mean to take all possible places. So as you can see in this example, this is a set of places of this field, but there can be other set of places. So the, this field can have many, many other places. So typically what you do, you have your field and then you choose a set of places, typically that satisfies the product formula. Okay, so now here I have a set of places of K. I have normalized them. And then I look at the places of F that divide one of the chosen places of K. And now I can normalize as follows. So I will say that the norm of some X with respect to W will be equal to, then I take the norm of the field extension FW with respect to KB of X. Then I take the absolute value with respect to B and then I take one over and now the index K uh, F over K. Okay, so the point is that I want to normalize the absolute value W from the absolute value in W in B. Then the idea is, okay, I have X, it lives on F, I can take the norm from F to K. But instead of taking this norm, what I do is I take the completion of K on B and I take the completion of F on B because I am only interested in what happens on B. Remember that a place determines the topology, so it determines the, the completion. And then I take the norm in this finite extension. And then I take in this finite extension, I take the absolute value determined by B, and then I take this normalization. So this gives me a way, so if I have normalized the places of K, I automatically have a way to normalize the places of F. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, the way I have chosen the, the normalization means that if MK satisfies the product formula, so X is in F, yes. But F is always contained in FB, not W in the completion. Yes. 
exactly. And then I take the, the norm to the completion of V. The point is that if you only look at, so over V, there are many places. And then if you take the norm of F over, over K, you are mixing all these places. And you don't want to mix all these places. You want really to look what happens on the place W. This is why you complete, to localize in some sense. Mm -hmm. It's one over the index between F and K. No, 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 not the local one, the global one. What? Yes. At the end, it is related with the ramification index, these things here. Because in some sense, you have three indexes depending on the number of places that are over B, the ramification index of everyone, and then the global is one probe. So it is related. So one can play around these three indexes. But the important thing, so the way I have chosen this is because if MK satisfies the probe formula, then MF also satisfies the probe formula. Okay, so this is one of the reasons uh, I have chosen this, this uh, particular normalization. Well, in any case now for every number field, okay, I have now this M of K coming from the set of places of Q. So I have chosen a normalized set of places for Q. I know that for any finite extension, I have a way to normalize the, the places of the finite extension. So I have defined a set of places satisfying the product formula for all number fields. Okay, and then I have this. And now I can give a new formula for the height. Ah, yes, I forgot to say one thing is that when I say that a field MK satisfies the probe formula, I mean that this probe is equal to one. But of course, this set can be infinite. So implicitly in this, I am also saying that uh, the absolute value or the B absolute value is equal to one except for a finite number of these. So in the, in the fact that my set of places satisfies the probe formula is implicit the fact that for every element of the field, there is only a finite number of absolute values different from one. That most absolute values will be, because if not, this probe will not have a meaning in principle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now proposition. If I have a algebraic number, let's say now alpha is an element on Q bar minus zero, then I can choose K, a number field, such that alpha belongs to K. I take any one. So I, uh, the point is that I want a finite extension of, of Q. And then the height of alpha is exactly equal to the sum for all W inside the set of places of this field K of log plus of the absolute value of alpha with respect to W, okay? And this formula is true for any field I choose that contains K. And in order to have this formula is why I have chosen exactly this normalization. So. I could have chosen many other possible normalizations, but this choice is just exactly done to see that this formula is true. Yes, log plus, I told before, so this is the sum of, for W's inside 
m of k of the max between zero and log of absolute value of alpha w. So the log plus is just the positive part of the log. It's a zero or the log. Okay, so as you have seen, I have written now the height as a sum of local contributions. So I have a contribution for every place of my field. Okay, instead of having a completely global contribution. Any question now? Okay, so this was part two, uh, algebraic numbers. Now, the next thing is what to do. So I want something a little bit more geometric. <clears throat> now we are in one three. This will be points in projective space. Okay, so now I have an element alpha that can be written as alpha zero up to alpha n. And this is a point in Pn of Q bar. Okay. And then I want to define a height in the same spirit as before. Okay, then definition the height of alpha will be given as the sum for all W inside M of K of the log of the max of the absolute values of the different representatives. So the sum from i equal to zero up to n. Okay. Oh, this alpha is, yes. So the height of alpha is just this log here. For example, if I have a n equals to one, K, K, K. Oh, yes. K is a field. Such that alpha belongs to P N of K. Yeah. So the point is that I start with an algebraic point. I choose a field that contains it. I have normalized the places. So the result will not depend on the field. And then I define the height as this one. Okay. For instance, if N is equal to one, I can embed Q bar minus zero inside of P1 of Q bar, just sending some alpha to the point one alpha. And now if I use this formula, the max can be outside the log, and then I get that the height I obtain is exactly the same as I have written before. So this height of points in projective space is just a generalization of the height I have defined it previously. Okay. No, the point is, no, here is log, because I am taking the maximum for all elements. Let's do this example complete. So now this will be, in this case, this is in the case n is equal to one. This will be the sum for all w inside m of k of log of the max between one and the absolute value of alpha. Now the mass can be outside the log, log of one is zero. So this is just the sum for all W of 
max between zero and log of alpha. And then you get the log plus. So the log plus comes because you have a representative that has a one. And then this is why you get the maximum between zero and the rest. But if you don't want to choose a representative, then you can write it just like this. Okay. Now, for instance, uh, we know that there are many ways to represent a point in predictive space. So if I multiply all these numbers by the same algebraic number, I obtain the same point. But then if I multiply all the terms by the same number, then I get here as a sum, the logarithm of the absolute value of the number. So the fact that my set of places satisfies the product formula implies that this is well defined. So in order to have that this is a good formula, I need to know that the places satisfies the product formula. This is one thing. Now, another thing is that once I have proven North code formula for points algebraic numbers, also almost by the definition, you can see that the height of a point will be, so if I take, for instance, a primitive representative, then the height of a point will be bounded by the heights of the coefficients which automatically implies since I know that algebraic numbers by, with bounded heights are bounded, then I also will get that the numbers of algebraic points with bounded heights and bounded degree are also bounded. Okay, so the North Coast property is also valid for points in the predictive space. And also the root of unity, uh, the, the characterization of elements of height zero will also uh, tell me that the elements of height zero will be elements in the maximal compact torus inside the predictive space and some extra points. So maybe let's look at, at a little bit in more detail of the case to P1. And this Kronecker result. If I look at again, at now P1 of Q bar. And I look at points P inside this guy such that the height of the point P is equal to zero. Which points do I get? Of course, if my point is different from zero and infinity, then this is an algebraic point. The height is the same as the height of an algebraic point. So it is a root of unity. So it will be the points of the form one, and then set, where set is a root of unity. But I also have the point one zero and the point zero one. So you can check easily that these two points also satisfies the product formula. So not only the roots of one, but also the point zero and the point infinity satisfies the, the product formula. But then you can see that this is equivalent so let's take an any n bigger strictly than one, an integer. Then satisfying this condition, this is equivalent that the point P is periodic for the map from P1 of Q bar to P1 of Q bar, given by Z goes to Z to the end. Okay, so in some sense, we have a categorization of the points of height zero in terms of this dynamical system. So the points of height zero are exactly the periodic points with respect to this system here. Okay. Okay. Any, so you take any number which is bigger than one, and then the periodic ones for this uh, dynamical system will be exactly the ones of degree zero. Okay. Any question up to now? Well, now we have points in predictive space. Uh, we will come to this uh, tomorrow. So for the moment, I am extending the knife height, and then tomorrow we'll see how to make 
very different heights, and then we'll see how to recover all the other uh, examples of heights. Yes. Now, uh, the fourth case will be points in a projective variety. So I have now x over q, a projective variety. And then I want to define a height that goes from x of q bar to the real numbers that satisfy, for instance, Northwood property. So how can I make a easy definition? Yeah, this is why I have saying that I have a projective variety. So choose L an ample line bundle over Q. And then this will give me a map from x to p n for some big n, and in particular, I will get a map from x q to p n of q, and then the naive height to the real numbers, and then I have now a height on any variety. Okay, and this height will automatically satisfy the north code property because since we already discussed that the projective space satisfies north code property. Then this also satisfies not code property on Xn. And for many purposes, this is a very good and nice height. Now, <clears throat> what are the problems we face here? So, first is that uh, this is a very particular case of heights. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. So you have to choose an ample line bundle and a basis, yes, of uh, of sections. Because the point is that uh, when I was defining the height in the projective space, I was saying that the height is independent on the representative of the point, but not on the coordinates. If I change coordinates by an element of Q, then I get different height. So only if I change coordinates by an element of set, the, change, the height is not changed. But if I, so if I take an invertible matrices with integral coefficients and determinant one, the height of the new point will be the same. But if I take just any rational matrix, the height will change. So it's absolutely true that I need to choose the line bundle and I need to choose the, a given basis to have a, because this is not an abstract PN, this is the canonical PN. So this means that the basis has to be chosen. Okay, so given an ample line bundle and a choice of basis of the global sections over Q, then I can define the height. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, so the point is that you start with an ample, then you take a high end of power, and then you choose a basis, yes. And also the point is that uh, you can then go back to, the, to a base, to a height, that only depends on L, just taking the root of the height you obtain in this case. So, in some sense, as we will see tomorrow, you can associate the heights to much more general objects. Okay. So now the points are twofold. So, on one hand, uh, not all the heights we are interested will be of this shape, because as as I was hinting before, typically what you want is to have a dynamical system. And you want a height, for instance, that is invariant with respect to this dynamical system. And then possibly a, a height that is invariant through a dynamical system will not be possible to write in this way. Okay. Another point is that I have explained how to define heights of points. But maybe we want also define heights of subvarieties. And then this approach only tells me how to uh, define heights of points. So there is a way to define heights of subvarieties, for instance, one can say, okay, I have the Chow variety, that any sub variety here is a point in this Chow variety, and then I can define the height there. But then this also makes things a little bit complicated to relate the 
height of a variety with the heights of its points. And then we need a, another method to, to define heights. That is a little bit more like the degree. So remember that in geometry, once you have the degree, you can say, okay, I have my projective variety. Then I choose an ample divisor. And then what is the degree? The degree is just the intersection of the ample divisor n of times with my sub variety. And there is a uniform way to define the height for all possible varieties. Then I want to do the same. I want to give a intersection theoretical interpretation of the height in such a way that then the height of any variety will be defined as an intersection theory applied to the height. That this will be tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Questions? So, yeah. Any questions or comments? No, 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 no. So the point is that, uh, so basically the idea is that in some sense arithmetic is like geometry in families. And then the base is just the number field. And then you have a family of varieties over the number field. Then the degree will be uh, in some sense is like uh, asking of the degree of the generic fiber while the height will be asking of the degree inside the family. And then there are relations, but they are not directly related. Okay, so, and then this is why you have these two invariants. So the, the degree will be in some sense, the degree of the, of, on the generic fiber, but the total degree will be really some intersection on the family. And then the degree will be, so if you have a variety of dimension N, the degree will be like some N-fold intersection, while the height will be an N plus one N-fold intersection in this family. Change the basis, does it change to some kind of bounded or some, yes. some comparison? Yes, yes, yes. So, in some sense, once you fix the change of basis, you have these rational numbers, and then you know what is the size of these numbers, and then you can see that two heights will be related by a bounded function. So, the, this thing, so if I change the basis, in some sense, the, if you define a height as a equivalence class of functions up to bounded functions, which is one of the, vial, the height the machine of Bile. If he defined classes of height like this, then any basis will give you a, an equivalent definition of height. Okay, so, so. Ah, uh, no. Uh, if change the line bundle. I think that if you change the line bundle, you will also get almost uh, an equivalent height. Because you can always go to the to the to the common uh, product, and then you can compare these two, and at the end you will get uh, also you will bound. Yes. Yeah. 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 What? No. So uh, that's the point that. This is what I was saying that you cannot change the basis. So this is why you have to choose a basis because uh, if you change by an element of GLN of Q, the height will change. If you change by an element of GLN of set, then the, the height will not change. I mean, this is clear because for instance, if I take P1 of Q and then I take the translation by one over 27, of course one has height uh, zero, but one over 27 does not have height zero. So if my matrix has uh, rational coefficients, the height changes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we also have a self map for X of Q bar uh, as we had for, which uh, maybe the restriction of the self map from. No, 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 no. So. Uh, the point is that in general, we don't have automorphism of X. What I am saying is that one of the things one is interested is when one has a variety X that has an automorphism, and then you have a dynamical system, you would like to have a height that in some sense is compatible with this, with this uh, dynamical system. So you would like something that the height of the translate is related with the height of the original one. Like it was happening on multiple, in X to the N, that the height of X to the N is N times the height of X. And then what I'm saying is that in general, since the automorphism of X does not need to come from an automorphism of PN, then maybe there is no, uh, it's not clear that you can uh, define your height 
from the height of pn. So, but in general, x does not need to have any automorphism. So for a general x, it's not an issue. No, no, because uh, it's what I was saying before that we want that the heights of all the conjugates are the same. So, in other ways, what we want is that the height has to be something invariant by Galois. So, and we will see later that uh, these heights are interesting, for instance, to study how Galois orbits evolve. Because, in some sense, when you are looking at the height, we are putting all the Galois orbit in the same in the same place. So, in some sense, more than thinking about points, it's better to think about Galois orbits in this sense because it is independent by the Galois. Yeah, so if there is no further questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.